Thank you very much, uh, Laurent, and I'd actually like to stay with you for a moment. Um, you are uh, the co-founder and co-CEO of a European company, and therefore the European AI Act will be uh, a very, very um, pertinent piece of legislation. Uh, what is your thought on the uh, way uh, in which the EU AI Act uh, can regulate generative AI uh, in, a, in, a, in a successful way? Uh, thank you for this question. I mean, to, to be honest, I'm a bit like uh, all my uh, the fellow innovators here in Europe. Uh, I'm I'm a bit worried. Uh, I would say by the regulation, by over-regulating, there's a risk of divide between continents where technology is made in the uh, outside of EU. I would say in the US, of course, but also in the China, in Middle East, uh, that's becoming very active in the field. Uh, and we in Europe only buy this technology, like we buy the cloud, we buy the chips, we buy the internet search and so on. Uh, so it's not too late. Uh, we are at a technological revolution and that's precisely when everything is being designed that there's a reshuffle of uh, maybe leading position. Uh, here in Europe, we have a good innovation. We, we have a, a smaller but a very active ecosystem, uh, especially in uh, startups, but also in academia and so on. So it's, uh, uh, let's not break the dynamics. Of course, I'm, don't take me wrong. I'm not saying that regulation is not important. We, I mean, we have discussed the, the technology are very disruptive and there are many bad ways of using that. Uh, uh, but it, I'd say the focus should be more on the use cases, the way we use the technology rather than the regulating the technology itself. And I would say uh, what I've seen as a proposal to regulate this type of uh, technology uh, applies to like uh, the deep learning type of technology we were designing 10 years ago, but we had to like bring guarantees on the uh, uh, sufficient level of accuracy. Uh, what does it mean for general purpose technology accuracy for, for which? So, so we, we are here in, in terms of we have to think of use cases and in a specific use cases, of course, you can bring guarantees and the accuracies and so on, but it's, it's very difficult to assess uh, the technology in itself. And I would say uh, uh, the, if we really have to comply a priori, it will be extremely expensive, extremely hard, extremely challenging for us to do. Uh, and again, this favors monopoly. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I, I would advocate for a diversity of factors like uh, Large companies, of course, we work with AWS. Uh, we should not be opposed to them. We should work together. But uh, there has to be uh, space for startups, for academia, for open source, all these type of uh, different actors uh, with an emphasis mm -hmm. of, uh, on academia. I would say I'm, myself, I'm a, a former university professor, and I'm terrified that this domain is being shaped only by for-profit organizations like uh, large companies. So uh, I, would, I would push for... Uh, regulation, but uh, that brings uh, a diversity of new actors. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Laurent. And if we talk about diversity of new actors, uh, it seems uh, obvious to also turn to uh, Sasha uh, and, and hear your thoughts on the way in which the EU AI Act can, can uh, ge regulate generative AI, just given that this is the most advanced uh, piece of regulation that we, we are discussing at the moment. Thanks for that question. Uh, our core mission at AWS is to democratize access to AI ML uh, and to empower startups with the tools to use AI ML to transform their community. So very much resonate, Laurent, with what uh, you were saying and also resonate with uh, the way in which you articulated the struggle that's ongoing for, from countries in the EU to navigate how to successfully regulate this kind of technology because they're in front of two challenges. One is that they want to take advantage of the economic opportunities that you mentioned with the Goldman Sachs uh, review. And then the other side is that they obviously want to make sure that they are protecting the fundamental rights, health, and safety of their citizens. So how do we make sure that we have a use case specific approach to regulating this technology that doesn't unintentionally regulate low risk use cases and allows for the practical application of this technology? And I think there are two concrete ways, Sebastian. The first is uh, to focus on risk-based approaches and use case specific regulatory uh, approaches. And then the second is to embrace international standards as a mechanism for fostering global interoperability 
interoperability. And I see a lot of people from the standards world, including you, uh, around the table. So I hope that that resonates um, in terms of the possible way forward. In terms of risk-based approaches to AI regulation, I think one of the biggest successes of the OECD AI principles is that they laid the groundwork for a common understanding about how AI should be regulated, notably through the accountability principle which recognizes different roles of developers and deployers of AI systems and different contexts. And from our perspective, because we see the risk associated with AI as inherently dependent on context, what we hear from our customers is that regulations will be most effective when they target the specific high-risk use. Uh, and Laurent mentioned it himself in his best place to say this, that overly broad regulation or regulating AI as a generic technology would in fact harm the innovation ecosystem in Europe, but also beyond. Um, for generative AI and foundation models in the framework of the EU AI Act, how to regulate this, uh, we see this uh, not uh, only uh, the need to consider uh, that these models are not de facto high-risk AI systems, but a when they are deployed in high-risk contexts, responsibility for compliance falls on the deployer that provides this intended purpose to this high risk use case of generative AI. And secondly, if tailored requirements are developed, that they are developed based on technical feasibility and internationally recognized standards building on the OECD principles. Um, lastly, I just want to mention briefly the question of standards because uh, interoperable trustworthy AI was a pillar of the OECD principles, as was ensuring a policy environment that opens the way for the deployment of trustworthy AI systems. Uh, so we see standards really as a kind of Rosetta Stone, which will help customers and governments uh, be able to translate these regulatory requirements into compliance mechanisms. When we talk to our customers about the EU AI Act, their primary concern is that they want to understand when, why, and how to comply with these upcoming regulatory regimes. And this kind of clarity um, that is provided largely through standards, we see as absolutely essential. Uh, we look forward to obviously continuing to work with OECD because we see that as a particularly appropriate place to think about, and you're doing this already in your working groups, how to, for example, classify risks. And we see that as an absolutely essential piece to ensuring that kind of market interoperability going forward. Thank you, Sasha. And we've heard a few times now the issue around, uh, well, the access to those models, that only a small number of entities are capable of training those and providing those models, and what it means for the uh, democratization of access, and also for issues of control, who controls the training, who controls the training data. And I'd be quite curious, uh, turning to you, uh, uh, Rebecca, in particular, um, the term that's sometimes being used is, is, is a compute divide uh, in terms of resources, in terms of control, in terms of competencies. And I would be curious to, to uh, understand your perspective on how those issues around uh, compute divides, about access, about control uh, should be handled. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to say I absolutely agree with that last point with regard to standards and inter interoperability and the role of the OCD through the principles to really guide some of this collective international work. And that leads me back to the question of um, the digital divide, the, the notion of uh, very large uh, companies and entities and labs having the capacity to deploy uh, these models uh, and the challenges for smaller organizations in order to do this. And I have um, sort of three perspectives on this that I wanted to share. One is I think there is um, an increased burden of transparency and accountability with regard to those large uh, entities that are deploying those models, really in terms of providing access uh, for external scrutiny and oversight with regard to the development and deployment of those models because of the the size and power and influence that they are having over uh, markets um, uh, around the world. And so I think that's one piece of the question, which is both how do we set collective uh, protocols around uh, how uh, large entities can uh, can do that responsibly while protecting uh, their own uh, competitive uh, interests, but uh, it, with some sense of independence uh, and external scrutiny. So I think that's important in terms of the corporate actors. I think that's also important in terms of governments thinking about how they set up systems whereby um, they can 
can support that work. But I, I also want to bring up two other points with regard to the digital divide. And, and both of these, I think, have uh, relevance with regard to um, the fact that many of these entities, in fact, all of them are in uh, highly developed um, uh, economies. So when we think about the majority world and the way in, and the implications of the deployment of these models in terms of countries where that are not uh, building these capacities or may not have um, economies in order to do this, I think we really need to understand one, uh, the, the workers and the workers and the labor, the impact on labor with regard to these systems, both in terms of um, how many workers in the global south are being uh, employed to uh, train or rate um, uh, AI systems or otherwise. We did some work uh, with DeepMind specifically looking at how do you responsibly and equitably so, uh, source uh, data enrichment workers in the development of this work. I think that's a key piece that we have to keep in mind as we think about um, size and scale in terms of the deployment. Uh, we need to think about um, uh, the impact in terms of climate and sustainability of these large scale models and what does that mean in terms of um, uh, the majority world in particular in terms of impact. And then we also need to think about uh, impacted communities. Um, and uh, Hiroki uh, talked a little bit about um, the um, potential for algorithmic uh, bias and discrimination with regard to these systems. And so how do we um, intentionally set up ways in which citizens can be engaged uh, in not only in the development of these systems, but in understanding some of the uh, implications uh, in that work. And I'll just mention in that regard uh, that we've been intentionally trying to think about how do we shift the gaze to center the people, the workers, the citizens who are impacted by these technologies into the technology development uh, conversation. And we were really pleased at the Summit for Democracy, uh, which is hosted by the State Department and the White House together with uh, governments around the world uh, recently to announce um, the launch of a, a global task force to focus specifically on this question of how do you set up structures and systems in order to engage citizens much more directly in thinking about not only the implications of the technology, but the ways in which we can better specify the models, better uh, create responsible and transparent systems so that we can, at the end of the day, do what we've all been talking about, which is really thinking about deploying these these systems for the benefit of people and society. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. And I see that, uh, Keith, you've already raised your hand uh, to, to comment on, on these same issues. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you to be as concise as possible because we're already yeah. starting to run against yeah. the clock. Thank yeah, you. I will. So, look, I just want to make I just want to make two points uh, on the on the topic of the democratization of this technology and and the concern over the consolidation and dominance, uh, as uh, Hiroki put it in the beginning of his presentation. I, I know right now it does look that way, right? I mean, there are big companies uh, that that have access to to the computing systems and access to the data model, you know, the data sets, and frankly, just the resources in general. Uh, you know, the, the, it, you know, not you know, a lot of the innovation is coming out of Silicon Valley and a few companies. But I'll tell you what's actually happening that maybe they're not in the headlines, and this is how it's going to play out. First off, uh, you know, almost every country that I speak to is 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 either already started to or looking at investing and building their own sovereign foundation models, and so you're going to see a lot of a lot of activity happening there across the world. I think within. Within two years, uh, most developed nations will already be well down their way. Sweden already has it, uh, you know. So, so it's it's going to happen pretty much at scale. So, there's going to be a lot of sovereign uh, investment in in more sort of indigenous uh, foundation models. That's number one. And, and number two, uh, yeah, sure, the biggest companies, the tech space, are definitely out in front, and and for good reason. But but that that again, that's not the whole story. There are at least a thousand startups across the world that are building their own their own versions of of both general purpose transformers and then more domain specific ones that are fine tuned around specific areas. And, and, and you're just going to see a, I mean, you, the democratization of technology is happening already quite widely. And so whether you're using a, an API from, from, you know, from Microsoft, uh, on their chatbot, or or or, or you're you know you're down using an open source model from from Hugging Face or or, or Nvidia or, or or whatever. There's actually a lot of different ways to go about this, and so there's a few big names in the headlines today. But it'll be a very different conversation a year from now. And so I just want to say there's actually a lot going on that maybe is not as obvious. But I I do not believe that there will be a few companies that control this technology. Just to, I do not think that's going to play out at all. 
Thank you very much, uh, Keith, for your for your assessment of the of the situation. And uh, we've actually got got uh, the numbers now from the poll, and uh, it's a fairly uh, solid um, a number of responses. So we've got around 200 responses, um, which makes the numbers quite meaningful. As expected, uh, pretty much everyone has heard about the the the, the letter. Uh, th there is a uh, substantial, sizable fraction of people who support it, um, but. Uh, an equally sizable fraction who uh, are very critical and say, well, that's, that might be nice, but it's not realistic. But interestingly, by far the um, largest number of answers, and in fact, almost the majority of, of answers, uh, uh, agrees with the statement that, well, if technology advances rapidly, then policy making has to advance just as rapidly uh, in, in new approaches and new formats. And this really confirms that we are spending our time very wisely here and also confirms that the OECD is spending time and resources very wisely in uh, um, having and uh, fostering those uh, policy discussions. Um, and uh, I'd, 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 I'd like to, um, uh, with, with, with an eye on time, uh, I'd like to first of all ask uh, our, our guest, Dragos uh, Tudorake, um, uh, to provide his view and his his closing thoughts, and hopefully we'll have a few minutes left at the end uh, for one one or two questions from from the room and the audience here as well. So uh, very welcome, Dragos Tudorak, and we're curious about your thoughts. Over to you. Well, um, first of all, good afternoon. Many thanks for the invitation, and, and sorry for not having been able to come in earlier. Uh, just I caught the last minutes, the last changes you've had, and clearly. This was a very rich uh, afternoon for you. Uh, fortunately, also, uh, I'll have to literally run uh, at, at uh, half past uh, because I have to, to uh, propose one of my files uh, at the working group in, in plenary. We are in Strasbourg in the plenary, so it's a very busy, busy week. So I'll be very, very short so that I also have these time for questions at the very end. Um, I'll actually pick up on exactly where you left it, presenting the results of the uh, of the of the questionnaire, I guess in the room, um, and it's actually I, I was smiling when I saw the results because you may or may not know that we have just two days ago replied ourselves uh, to that letter, uh, and when I say we, uh, I mean the entire body of uh, rapporteurs and shadow rapporteurs working on the AI Act, and we did so because we also thought, like it seems, the majority uh, of those. That responded to the questionnaire, we thought that the solution is not asking for a pause uh, on the development of technology or for a moratorium, but to actually uh, take very considerable uh, responsible action in providing the right policy responses to that. And it's true that it is a technology that is very fastly moving and it's not easy to find the right uh, rules to put in place and the right policies to put in place but it should not be taken away from the responsibility you have, those of us that have the responsibility of making policy and, and regulating to, to actually do so. So maybe that's the point what, which I want to make, uh, because we are literally in the final uh, stages of, of wrapping up our working parliament on the AI Act. We were, in fact, supposed to wrap it up today. Uh, we had this afternoon uh, planned uh, for the last, uh, what we call political shadows meeting, so basically the last meeting at political level between uh, the, the team of the Rapporteurs, we were uh, not able to do so. We returned to a, still a technical meeting because we are uh, still uh, figuring out the package of rules, the regime that we would apply to general purpose and particular foundational models and generative AI, uh, which, as you know, it's an endeavor that we as Parliament have taken um, upon ourselves um, even before December and the emerges of the big debate in, in, in the public domain on generative AI, GPT, etc. Uh, we, we thought from the very beginning that uh, we cannot, uh, in a way, miss this opportunity of having the AI Act in our hands and not say something and, and not devise a, a, a dedicated regime for, for uh, foundational models. And I fully agree with one of the uh, colleagues intervening before saying that what we need is not a uh, a, a, a de facto or even express application of the label the uh, high risk on, on uh, foundational models. That's not the solution. And that's not what we're doing, just to be very clear. 
I can't say exactly how the negotiations in the last couple of days uh, are going to, to end, but I can pretty uh, comfortably say that we are not going to simply uh, put uh, foundational models into the high risk effective. What we are doing is to try and see which of the obligations that we have right now in various parts of the text will actually apply maybe in different form, but will apply to the specificities of general purpose AI and foundational models in particular. We are working in fact on two levels. One is to write a set of rules that apply to all general purpose AI and which have to do mostly with obligations that uh, providers of such models would have uh, for, the, for the entities uh, downstream in the value chain of AI. But also a dedicated regime, a specific provision that we're introducing in the text on foundational models. We are defining what foundational models would be, the scope of this regulation in, in a dedicated definition in Article 3. And we are using the Stanford definition, again, just to make sure. I also heard uh, many speaking of, of the importance of internationally recognized standards. I have been advocating for that from the very start, and I'm very happy, in fact, that having closed last week already the part of the text for the standards, I can say that I think we've done a, a good uh, job in Parliament in really moving completely a, a bit the, the philosophy of the text, which initially was saying that the Commission would be writing our specifications into actually uh, standards work done in the standard setting bodies where, from my point of view, they should be done. And then I think we'll also be uh, allowing for uh, alignment uh, at the national level in terms of standards, which would be so fundamentally important for ensuring convergence on, on how we develop in the future, accepting the fact that in terms of norms, we would probably be in different, uh, in different speeds, uh, in different jurisdictions, but I think that is okay. We will have to live with that as long as, again, we work together in converging standards. And again, the, the principles are aligned and OECD has done tremendous work in making sure that we are aligned on principles and, and, and that's, I think, is, is, is important. So that's where we are. Still some tweaks also on how we do with high risk. Uh, we are introducing, and again, that's, that's a, 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 an objective on our side in bringing balance between the uh, objective of the regulation to provide protection to individual rights, to, 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 to the health of our society, so on and so forth, but at the same time, to encourage innovation, not to put unnecessary barriers to, to, to growth and, and to the uptake of AI in our economies, because that's, I think, what we should all want, or at least there is, a, I think, a solid majority in this house which wants that. So uh, the way we have tweaked what the Commission should be proposing, how to deal with high risk, uh, ensures, from my point of view, and again, I think we're going to have a majority for that, getting some, some, some tweaks uh, which are still pending in the coming days. But we are not only uh, having the annex of the AI Act, which lists the domains which are high risk, which from, from the point of view of, of, of us who proposed the filter was, was not enough because it was unnecessarily labeling generically domains as high risk uh, without accepting that there might be uh, God knows how many variations of, of use cases that actually might not be high risk, but just because they would be developed in that particular domain, that particular area, they would unnecessarily have to, to, to bear the compliance costs. Uh, and therefore, we have introduced a filter with a threshold, a significant risk that would have to be assessed, self assessed, again, something that remains in the text. The logic of self assessment remains in the text. It will be a self assessment that would be done. Am I? actually pass the threshold of significant risk, even though I am in the, in the domains of high risk in Alex 3, uh, answer yes, no, which is an answer, an answer which I give myself. If no, uh, if yes, then of course I, I go to compliance. If no, I simply notify the regulator that I am in that situation and, and, and that's it. So again, our effort is to, is, is to bring balance in all, of the key, in all these key provisions of the text uh, so, so that we, we, we keep those two objectives in, in, in check. Um, and, and in terms of timing, and I'll stop and, and, and still have a few, few, few minutes for, for uh, questions and answers. Uh, in terms of timing, uh, we are now uh, working with uh, a next week uh, scheduled meeting, which is meant to be the last meeting, which means that we'll be able to vote in committees early May now. So we're pushing a bit uh, the, the, the calendar again with, with, with about two weeks. Uh, voting in committees in, in early May and uh, early June. Uh, vote in the plenary, which means maybe a handshake, a uh, symbolic handshake with the Swedish presidency before the end of June, but the actual uh, work, the bulk of the work uh, in the negotiations with the Council uh, to be done uh, under the Spanish presidency, and then we have already a calendar 
uh, that we work with the Spanish, the Spanish presidency. And I'm pretty confident that we can actually finish by the end of the year. So I'll stop here and, and take a few questions if I can. Thank you very much, uh, Dragos, for this uh, insight. Well, I would say into the boiler room of policy making um, and the, the, the cutting edge of the uh, discussions, and also in particular the uh, status update on how generative AI is likely to be handled in the AI Act, at least from the perspective of the uh, Parliament. And uh, I, of course, very much liked your remarks about uh, European standardization and the role of it as the JTC21 chair. Um, we've got about, uh, I think, three minutes left uh, in, 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 in this session, and uh, hopefully we can, we can uh, handle one or two very brief questions and very brief answers. Um, and I see... Ooh, well, Maybe no, if, if I may just collect the questions, and then at the end I'll try to, to, to bundle the answers. We, 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 will, we will collect questions. So, so I see lots of hands going up here in the room. Uh, so can I ask you to be extremely brief? We'll just collect the questions and no guarantees that we can answer them all. But I'd just like to go around the room. I think the first hand was over there. Hi, my name is Carlos Ignacio Gutierrez. I represent the Future of Life Institute, the organization that created the letter. Just a really quick reflection on our ethos for this letter and the organization. We believe in proactive action with high-risk AI systems. Um, maintaining a reactive approach is something that we want to avoid because of the mysteries that can happen with these systems that have emerging capabilities, have possibilities that we don't know about. And the reason that we created this letter is to generate two proactive calls. The first proactive call is to action. Uh, first, it's self-governance. We ask organizations to self-govern their own models so as to benefit the rest of society and have a race to the top. And if that doesn't work, then we ask governments to act, act in favor of their jurisdictions. We now have a short document in our website with potential policies that governments can um, evaluate to see which ones are best for them, but that's in our website now. It's called pause, um, policy making in the pause. And the second call to action is discussion. What we've been incredibly uh, encouraged about is the fact that everywhere in the world now, people are discussing the risks of these systems. And we don't believe in having a pause in all systems because not all systems have these society level risks, but just the the ones that are the largest and heaviest ones. Uh, we believe in a flourishing future, just like the Amazon representative mentioned. There's a lot of really good uses for AI, but we are concerned and want to be proactive. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I saw one hand at the far end over there. Thank you. My name is Inma Martinez. Um, I am an AI scientist. I have built AI for commercial purposes. And uh, I'm here as the uh, chair of the multi-stakeholder expert group at the GPA. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I'd like to uh, add to the conversation that I feel that there is a massive opportunity for us to think uh, of AI in different terms. Um, there's a before and after, as we know, just like when the moon landing uh, happened, we learned that unfortunately the moon is not made of cheese but also that is a place where you can live. That's why we are now going to Mars. And I think that our cheese in our situation is that many companies have developed AI for innovation, for innovation's sake, which many times derails and it doesn't contain any ergonomics or human factors, such as developing AI systems that compose music or paint, et cetera, and, and really ostracize humans thinking about that horrible future. I think the opportunity in our case lies in thinking of AI as a tool to build a better society, which is how many, many companies build and compete and are leaders, not just by innovating for innovation's sake, but by building better products. Lego, for example, hasn't changed the Legos in 25 years. So I think that there is room for us to have another mindset and track to think about AI as an ergonomic product and service fit for humans to use and in those terms, not just for innovation or policy or ethics. Thank you. Th thank you. Th thank, thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I'm having an eye on the Secretariat whether we can overrun for two minutes, but we're already eating into the next session. So uh, 
I, I think there was a hand from the UK and also from the US. Uh, it's been UK has been covered, so there's a hand from the from the. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for for, for moderating this. Uh, one of these questions for for Keith. First of all, thank you for your co-chairing the the OECD blueprint on building national AI capacity. A great report. Um, the question is, you know, a lot of the discussion here is how do we build trust in these generative AI systems? And the question is, what role does compute choices uh, play in, in helping facilitate and, and advancing trustworthy AI, this kind of technical dimension to, to AI compute or to AI? Thank you. Well, you know, the, these these systems are, are not simple, right? People talk about ChatGPT like it's one model, but it's a complex system, right, of models built on top of an even more complex stack of software and, and computers. So, so you know, and, and within that, you have, I think you have, and just I'm oversimplifying it, but you have basically two opportunities to do it right, right? You've got sort of the design phase and then you have later, right? And in the design phase, you know, you, you want to use, you want to use both pr principles and standards and techniques uh, to, to ensure that the data going in and the way that it's being trained, the actual nature of the training, you know, uh, ultimately as, as the, our, our the most recent speaker said, you know, things are being thoughtfully done through the lens of, of, of benefit to humanity and, and, and use, right? Uh, and so that, that has to be done early. And if it's not done early, well, then you have the even more complex job of cleaning it up post post training, which frankly, it's unclear. You can make improvements. There's no question you can put in guardrails, but it's it's a lot harder to do. And so the, the fine, the, the tools, the software tools, the, the compute used to, to fine tune these models, uh, they're they're in the early stages now. I mean, they're, they're coming out now. I mean, all the companies are sort of rolling out these tools that reduce bias and mitigate toxicity and, 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 and you know, affect, you know, reduce hallucinations and all these, all these challenges. Uh, th there are tools coming out, but we're in the we're in phase 1.0, right? So, so you, you definitely have a better product if you if you engineer it from the beginning more thoughtfully. So, so that is that that isn't really about computing as much as it is that whole stack of hardware and software and all the tools and techniques used. And, and that's I think the world is figuring that out together, you know. And and I, I saw a very interesting interview with Ilya Sutskivar, the co-founder of OpenAI, talking about that about the techniques that they're you know that they're putting in place. Uh, and, and I know that just my from talking to my own colleagues with NVIDIA, that the, the tools that we're rolling out and the different guardrails. So I know that there's an aggressive push from from industry to to deal with that issue, right? And so I think there'll be a lot of innovation on the tools, the fine tuning, and 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 that and whatnot. So it is a stack of technology. It's complex and requires a, a lot of a lot of thoughtful design uh, from the beginning to the end. Thank you very much, Keith. And uh, I I saw a very very urgent hand over there. Um, is that something that can be said in 30 seconds? Uh, yes, so apologies. Um, so Conrad Tucker, professor of mechanical engineering at uh, Carnegie Mellon. This is for my students. And so on behalf of the students uh, in the AI course I teach, they want to know how uh, the cultural aspects will be factored into the decision making for the metrics of trust. Okay, uh, I, I think this is one of the questions that is very important, that deserves long answers that we don't have time for in this session. But thank you very much for raising the question, and this is already the jumping off point for uh, future discussions. I would like to say a big thank you to uh, our keynote speakers, uh, to our panelists, to the Secretariat for preparing this session very, very uh, carefully.